And to come back to les rendez-vous du CNRS, we have tonight the great pleasure to welcome François Forger, who will explain what we know and what are the means used to understand the planet Mars. François Forger is a senior scientist. He is a research director at the CNRS in Paris, Institut Simon Laplace, and he worked two years at the JPL in Pasadena. Dr. Forger received many awards and prizes from the Foundation Del Luca, a prize from, from, uh, for the best science book, and the bronze medal of the CNRS. François Forger is regularly invited to radio and TV programs, and tonight he will give us some news from Mars. And this is presentation, in his presentation entitled, Planet Mars, the story of another world. François Forger. Good evening. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. And I thank you very much uh, all the team from the CNRS office here in Washington. Um, so I've slightly changed my title. Uh, the initial title was the story of another word. And in fact, I have uh, not enough time probably. So I will just tell you a few stories about from another word, planet Mars. Uh, of course, you have heard about a lot of stories uh, on planet Mars. What happened is that if you observe Mars in a telescope, and that's what was done for many, uh, many years uh, until the space age, what you see is very difficult to interpret. You see a yellow sphere with shape on it, and on this basis, a lot of fantasies were, were initiated. And because of that, there were lots of stories were invi invented um, about planet Mars. If you see the, the picture, you see that most of the time the Martians want to invite the Earth. You can also recognize the Martians because they always carry a, a, a woman in their... <laughs> so I would love to tell you these stories, but I have better stories to tell, real life stories. So it will, be, it will have been oops, good to tell stories about this, especially maybe in honor of Ray Bradbury, uh, the author of the Martian Chronicles who passed away yesterday. But... I will tell you stories about the real planet Mars, and I think they are interesting because there are lots of things which are surprising, scientific stories and exploration stories. So to do that, to learn about planet Mars, what you have to do is to go there. You, have to, you need to, uh, telescopes are not enough, and of course NASA went there in the 60s and the 70s, we learned a lot, but for us in Europe, in France, uh, we started, oops, we started with um, a mission that, that, uh, on which I've worked a lot. It was, it's called Mars Express. It's the first European spacecraft which was launched to orbit another planet. This is in Kazakhstan. We launched it from Baikonur because the Soyuz rocket was much cheaper than Ariane. And, uh, but it's part of an agreement with snow in Kourou, you know that. So, and in, on top of this rocket, it was a very impressive night launch. I had a great time there. And on top of this rocket, uh, you have this a small spacecraft uh, named Mars Express, very light Mars Express because it's cheap and was done very quickly. And about this, this uh, orbiter, you have uh, plenty of instrument uh, to observe Mars with, uh, with every angle. In terms of astrophysics, uh, what I mean is to observe Mars with at every wavelength. So we did that in the European way. You have, uh, maybe you can uh, turn down the light so you can see better the screen. Uh, so we did it the European way. What I mean is that there were uh, radar provided by the Italians. Actually, it's a U.S. Italian radar. You have uh, spectrometers from France, imaging spectrometer from France. You have um, uh, instruments from Sweden, uh, and you have also a camera from uh, Germany. And it has an appetizer. I will show you a few pictures from this camera. It's a stereo color uh, imager from Germany. And you can, as I also show you a few images from the surface of Mars. You can see giant volcanoes, ice on the surface in craters, chaotic terrains that was made when uh, lots of ice sublimed, uh, erosion patterns, uh, rock glaciers on Mars, uh, rivers, dry rivers, uh, the remnant of uh, giant floods that happened a long time ago, and so on. About this spacecraft, uh, we did it really in the European way, so the uh, British 
decided to do something a little different. They suggested in, in, uh, instead of uh, providing a remote sensing instrument, they suggested they could provide a lander, a small lander that will go on the surface of Mars, the smallest lander ever, named Beagle 2. Beagle 1 was the chip uh, that Charles Darwin used. So it's this small uh, thing that you can see here. And Beagle 2 was released a few days uh, on December 19, 2003, a few days before orbit insertion, it was supposed to descend, this is uh, of course computer images, supposed to descend into the atmosphere, release one, two parachutes, and then softly land on the surface. But in fact, that did not happen. We don't know what happened. Uh, it was actually the night of Christmas, a bitter gift. W the contact was lost, and we don't know what happened. And I use this story to tell you that um, in fact, exploring Mars is not easy. It's a difficult exploration. I won't tell you all the story of exploration of Mars, but I can tell you my story. Uh, I, in fact, uh, I started my career about 20 years ago working at NASA Ames Research Center. And uh, among the things, I started to work on a ex fantastic project named Mars Observer up there, a very big spacecraft. And the spacecraft was lost uh, during just before orbit insertion uh, in, the, in August uh, uh, 1993. And then I went back to Europe, and I worked a little bit on a big Russian-European project na named Mars 96, and this didn't work. The insertion toward Mars didn't work. The spacecraft finished at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Then I was very much involved in this spacecraft, Mars Climate Orbiter. And uh, this one um, missed the planet, not really, but the, the trajectory was not optimal, and it, it flew through the atmosphere and burned instead of flying above it. Uh, in 1999, and Mars Polar was lost, I could go on and go on. I could mention Phobos Grunt, a very big project, 40 tons sent toward Mars last November, with several uh, instruments provided by my French colleagues aboard. And uh, this didn't work as well. And there were a problem just after launch, and this is now at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so the, the, the message here is not that I'm... Uh, I'm I'm a bad luck bringer and that you should not fly with me in plane, but it's more that uh, it's a difficult exploration and that's millions of hours that have been lost there and uh, it's always a problem. But let's go on to Mars. Um, let's go with the first mission that worked during my career. It's Mars Pathfinder. Um, it's a small spacecraft, you may remember. It's uh, July 1997. You can see uh, solar panels a ramp here for this very small rover that went around uh, for a few meters. Uh, these are the airbags. And you can see this landscape, the Martian landscape, this desert-like landscape. It re really looks like the Earth. Uh, it, if you, when you see that, you feel like, okay, put a, maybe an a oxygen mask and go around. In fact, you cannot do that because the Martian atmosphere is very thin. It's 95% of carbon dioxide, but it's so thin that the at this pressure, your blood will boil and you will explode, and so it's not recommended to go. You need a space suit to go on, to, on Mars. Nevertheless, uh, it's not that different. The Mars, for instance, uh, has a lot of common in with, the, uh, with the Earth. Uh, and in fact, sorry, this at the, at the right here, where you can see here is a weather, uh, is a meteorological mast that measures temperature. And here are the kind of temperature that were observed uh, you can see here the, the length of the day on Mars is 24 hours and 40 minutes, almost like the Earth. So we divide the day by four 24 and we have Martian hours. And when we use this, um, you can see that uh, in the afternoon, um, the temperature is about minus 10 degrees Celsius. In fact, uh, the ground itself is well above uh, freezing. It's 20 degrees Celsius. And then, but the problem is that the following night, uh, because it's desert, it's hypercontinental, of course, there's no ocean, the atmosphere is thin, the temperature will drop by 80 Kelvin, 80, Celsius, 80 degrees, and you have very, very low uh, temperature. So you have a hyper-desertic, hyper-continental climate that is Mars. What you can see, so it's almost Earth-like, like a desert, but there is one difference that you can notice is that the, the sky is, uh, has this very special color. It's, it is pink or orange all the time. In fact, we all the, 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 ten, the thousands of pictures we have from the surface of Mars, the sky is always uh, orange like that. This is another picture, for instance, from the Viking lander in 1976, and you can see the sky, which is always orange. And the reason why the sky is orange is because you always have, in the Martian atmosphere, 
uh, particles of dust from the surface which are lifted by the wind and that are uh, in the atmosphere. So the sky is always arranged. There is one exception, is when the sun set. Uh, unlike on the Earth, actually it's the opposite of the Earth, when the sun set, the, the sun remains white all the time, and you have a halo which is blue, blue around. So it's the opposite of the Earth. The sky behind you remains orange, and uh, uh, the halo around the sun set is blue. So, um, Initially, it was a surprise to see all that dust in the atmosphere. And the reason is because the atmosphere is so thin. If you, if you use, a, for instance, a wind tunnel and try to leave the dust with such a low pressure, it's not easy at all. You need really strong winds. So how can such a thin atmosphere leave the dust? Now we understand what's going on. First, you have, and you can see here, an uh, image from the surface obtained by the NASA rovers. You have dust devils during the afternoon in most locations at some seasons. You have uh, dust devils like that. Some of them can be really big. They can reach thousands of kilometers high. And they can, of course, put a lot of uh, dust in the atmosphere. But what really puts a lot of dust in the atmosphere are, in fact, dust storms. We now know that every day on Mars, you have at least one small dust storm. And what I call small is what you see here. Uh, this is near the pole. So with the polar orbit, you can see the development of, this, uh, of these dust storms. You can see. Um, the dust storm, which reached uh, a size of a 300, 400, 500 kilometer. And that's every day on Mars, you have at least one dust storm like that. And at some season, this dust storm can reach a, a very large scale. Uh, very, uh, we call that the regional dust storms. You can see here at the top, you have a cold front. The weather, is the weather system, the meteorology is very much Earth-like. So you have a cold front, a low pressure, a cold front here that lifts the dust very high winds, and then the winds are carried by trade winds toward the equator, and ultimately they will be carried down by a monsoon jet. Like, So this is local, uh, these are regional dust storms. And at some season, some years, not every year, we observe a phenomenon which has no uh, equivalent in the solar system, which is a global dust storms. We have a global dust storms that um, that really uh, fill the entire atmosphere, the entire planet, with dust. This is an image from Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, in June, the first image on the left is June 26, 2001. A few days later, very quickly, the, the, the planet was completely shrouded in the dust like that, and that it, it remains like that for, for several months. And it happened some years, in 1956, 1971, 73, 77, and then nothing, and then 88, and then 2001, and 2007. And we don't know why it doesn't happen. Um, I do work a lot on atmosphere. I try to understand this, and we don't understand. So if you have a good idea why we have this uh, unpredictable system, it's, uh, it's, it's, in it's interesting. In fact, in 1956, it was a very good uh, period to observe uh, Mars from the Earth during summer 1956. And all the telescopes were ready to observe Mars as never before. And the young Carl Sagan uh, actually did his summer project on this. And the whole he could observe was this yellow, this uh, orange ball. And his, the conclusion of his uh, report was that uh, Mars is as interesting as a baseball without the knitting. If you, uh, once again, if you observe Mars through a telescope, I don't know if you have ever done that, you, you don't see much. What you can see sometimes is some white stuff at the, at on near one pole or the other. And most of the time, this white stuff is ice, but it's not water ice. What is it? It's actually a CO2 dry ice, frozen atmosphere. What happened is very simple. Uh, during the winter in the polar night, you have polar night, the, the seasons are about the same on Mars and on the Earth because the obliquity is about the same. Uh, what happens is during the polar night, the temperature drops to the to very low temperature, like 145K, which is minus 135 Celsius. I have no idea in Fahrenheit. And if at this temperature, with at this pressure, CO2 start to condense oops, and uh, accumulate on the surface. And you have a, a layer of frozen atmosphere. On the Earth, it will be a, a layer of frozen nitrogen, for instance, which can re reach uh, up to one meter. You can also have some uh, very specific clouds, CO2 ice clouds, very weird clouds composed of the main constituent of the atmosphere. And what is really weird, too, is what happens when the springs come back, the sun comes back. Then the suns start to hit this CO2. 
just like on the Earth. But on the Earth, when you sun hit a snowpack of water ice, well, the ice can melt, and you have a little river of liquid water that flows. But it's not the case here. What happened here, when you the, the, the photons go through the ice, usually because it's very transparent, hit the, s the ice from below, vaporize it, sublime it, you have CO2 gas, and we believe, we are absolutely convinced, that a part of this ice is uh, levitating above the surface. Until, of course, there is a break somewhere, and then you have a very... Uh, violent event, kind of geysers, that remove all the things. So we do believe that um, at, uh, at sunrise, at the end of, uh, of the winter, uh, the, the polar caps looks like that. You have geysers of CO2 that carry the sand and dust with them, and, and, and you have these things. And we have a picture of that, not really of the geyser, because they really happen uh, very early when you have no light. But the CO2 ice cap, uh, if you zoom on it, you can see the scale here. Uh, you have uh, brown deposits, and we are all very convinced that th th the process that make them is this process. You have this uh, erosion that goes from below the ice, high pressure gas that, uh, that uh, uh, flow through the ice and make these fan-shaped deposits. And also, when we understood that, that's a few years ago, we finally resolved a mystery that was in geology of Mars, is that in many, many locations you can see s what we call spiders, and no one could know, I mean, Earth geologists could not imagine what that is. And what that is, actually, is just the erosion that is done by this process related to the CO2 ice cap. So I've talked to you about dust, about uh, CO2 ice, but not about water. So that's the question I've, I've, I'm asked uh, by uh, lots of people very often. Is there water on Mars? And the answer is yes. First, um, Near the pole, uh, you, have, um, you can see actually here on the picture on the right, at the top near the northern pole, only at the north pole, you can see this white stuff. And this is not CO2 ice, this is water ice. In summer, you, have, uh, you can see, once the CO2 ice is gone, you can see this glacier around the northern pole, which is about 1,000 one one kilometers wide. In France, I usually say it's the size of France, but it doesn't work here. And, uh, and uh, it's covered by water ice, which is in inter interaction with the atmosphere. So what happened is very simple. Let's uh, zoom uh, to show you the structure. It looks like Greenland, uh, actually, uh, if, you uh, if you look carefully. So in northern summer, what happened is that this ice is uh, heated by the sun, and somewhat of vapor is released in the atmosphere. The atmosphere carries this vapor. It's not much water vapor, very little, small amount compared to the Earth. But because it's Mars is very cold, you can reach uh, condensation and you can form clouds, as you can see, and frost. This is a, another picture from the Viking uh, orbiter. It's a very famous uh, image. This is Olympus Mons, the very big volcano on Mars, 20,000 meters high, surrounded by water ice clouds during uh, northern summer. You have morning fogs for the exact same rhythm than on the Earth, and also for the same rhythm than on the Earth. At 40, uh, uh, in the mid-latitudes, like at 48 degrees north or at the equivalent of Washington, you will have frost in the winter that will connect. And this is water ice frost, not CO2 ice frost. What we have also learned by studying this water cycle, modeling it, observing it, is that there is, you can have surface ice, but you cannot have liquid water on Mars. The pressure is too low, it's too cold, it's too dry. So of course it's a problem, because on the Earth, as far as we know, life is all, uh, when you have, you, to have life, you need liquid water, and also wherever you have liquid water on the Earth, most of the time you have also life. So you really need liquid water for life as we know it. So it's a problem on Mars because there is no liquid water at least on the surface, so that's a big question mark. Is there uh, life on Mars? So far we have not been able to see anything, nothing big, nothing small. Um, so uh, that's a the, the, there is a real question. Personally, I'm not convinced that you can have uh, any form of life at the surface of Mars nowadays. But the real question for Mars is not Mars today. Is Mars in the past? And the reason why we believe that Mars in the past was different is when we look at the geology. This is a map of Mars topography. You can see, uh, you can recognize um, so the, the, the color uh, shows you the topography. In blue is the low plains, mostly in the northern hemisphere. And you have the plateau in the southern hemisphere. And what you can see is that whereas the northern hemisphere is not very much cratered, you can see the crater here, um, 
in the south, it's covered with crater. And by analogy with the moon, when you look at that, you can estimate the age of the surface. And you can see that when there is a lot of crater, the surface is very old. It's about 3.5, 4 billion years old. I mean, this, the surface, when you have a lot of crater here, uh, date backs from the beginning, of the, the, the youth of the planet. The planet was formed 4.5 billion years ago. So at f uh, the, the you have a, 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 a maybe half of the surface of Mars, which is very old much older than most of the place that we have on the Earth. And what's interesting is that when you look, sorry, I forgot to tell you that the other area you can see, you can see here the big volcanoes here in white, or you have all these big impacts. And this big uh, uh, canyon here is Valles Marineris, which is just a kind of rift. Nevertheless, coming back to the crater, all this old surface, which is in red, covered with crater, when you look with a high resolution camera, what you find is that wherever you have a loss of crater, a very old surface, is completely covered um, by these kind of things, which are something which look like a dry river, uh, dry river beds. And in fact, whenever the surface is old enough on Mars, you can see this, what we call valley networks. Here is another very famous example, Varigo Valleys, uh, which can see this big network, uh, which can be compared to the the, the Adramaut plateau here in, in, on the Earth, where you also have a driver. Of course, there's no water there, okay, you understand. This is four, three point, actually 3.8 billion years old uh, river. And if you look at the details, we can know with a, a good camera, we can see that there are lots of uh, small, um, uh, what could you call that, the drainage density, which gives you an estimation of how this, uh, uh, the, this river was formed really suggest that this river was formed by precipitation, rain, snow that melts subsequently, something like that. So the Mars at this time was very different. These valley networks were discovered in the 70s by the spacecraft Mariner 9 and then by Viking. This image is from Viking from the 70s. More recently with Mars Global Surveyor with a higher resolution camera, we were able to discover a lot of, uh, of uh, sedimentary deposits which really look like lacustrine deposits. This is one example. If you, this is another example where you have these hills. The, the, the picture is three kilometers wide here. And you can see this, all these layers making these beautiful hills. And if you show that to an earth geologist, he will tell you, I know what this is. This is uh, sediments that were uh, deposited at the bottom of a lake or at the bottom of an ocean. You need liquid water to do that. Of course, we were not completely sure because we also know that on this planet you have wind erosion for billions of years. But in fact, after that, there have been a lot of discovery of um, deposits which looks like that. And this is uh, in a crater named Herbels Valley. On the left here, you have a river, a dry river that, uh, that um, uh, arrived here. And then you can see this delta. This is a delta, lacustrine data, um, which is very, very similar in many details to uh, a delta on the Earth. So on this basis, this is from 2003. This was called the smoking gun for demonstrating that early Mars was um, wet with liquid water flowing. So we can speculate that Mars, maybe 4 billion, 3.5 billion years ago, was probably something like that with liquid water flowing. But there are lots of question marks. The first is that we don't understand I am study a lot the climate, I've, been, I've done a lot of work to try to imagine how this planet could have had such a warm climate at the time. And it's very difficult because the, the story is usually to say, well, maybe the atmosphere was thicker with a st stronger, more efficient greenhouse effect, so the climate will be warm. But when, you, when I model it, it doesn't work. So there is a big mystery. But the other side of this story is that uh, it is very exciting because 3.5 billion years ago, 4 billion years ago, this is the time when we know that life um, emerged on the Earth. So if Mars was like that, like the Earth at this time, maybe life started there. And that's really the, what is driving currently the, the Martian space program, is to uh, try to go back in time and understand what happened then. Of course, ideally, what we would like to do is to send uh, Julie Payette on the... <laughs> Well, but that's not Julie, sorry. Um, but to send astronauts, so I'm afraid, uh, unfortunately, uh, sending astronauts on Mars is uh, really challenging. It's extremely expensive. Science is not enough to justify that. I think it will happen sometime. I don't know when. Every year, the 
any program is delayed by more than several years. Nevertheless, that may happen. Maybe some, uh, I've seen some children in this room, maybe they will be involved in such a project. But meanwhile, because we cannot send astronauts yet, uh, what we do is we try to send uh, robots that will go there and act as a robotic geologist. And I will tell you the story of uh, a mission, the Mars Expression rover, two twin uh, robots. One is called Spirit, the other Opportunity. I'm sure you have heard about them. And I will tell you a few stories about them. Uh, this is uh, when they were in development at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, you can see these small uh, uh, things, which are a marvel of technology, really impressive uh, thing to see when they build it. I recommend you to, if you have any uh, way, to see uh, a movie about, not exactly about what happened on Mars, but how you build these things. It's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, let's go on Mars with them. We, they were sent uh, in 2003. In, Ju in June 2003, and this is a computer movie to tell you more. So I, I use this opportunity to tell you more about how you can go to Mars. In that case, this was, uh, this, uh, the Mars Explorer were sent on Delta II rocket. This doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. They were cheap. Um, and to go to Mars, the first thing you have to do is to go in Earth orbit. You need a big rocket. To send one ton to Mars, you need a 100-ton rocket. You go into orbit. And then the real difficulty is not really to have a big uh, rocket, is to have a very precise injection in orbit around the sun to reach Mars. So to have a very precise uh, injection, what NASA did for this uh, project, they, use, uh, the, they, they stabilize the direction of the spacecraft by making it rotating very fastly. So it's like a gyroscope. And then the axis is really stable. They start the engine and do the injection. And then they slow it by, by releasing small mass, as you can see. Remember when, if you did some physics, it was very well. And then it goes in, in cruise, we call that cruise, around the sun, halfway around the sun to go and reach Mars at the, at the same time. The first spacecraft, named Spirit, was targeted to go there, at the bottom of the image, at the, at the end of this big river, which is called Mahadim Valis, you have this big crater, which is 150 kilometers wide. So it's, it, it's called Gusev Crater. And we believe, it was believed that this crater had been filled with liquid water sometime in the past, and it was a big lake sometime in the past. So it was very exciting to go there, put a spacecraft there, and try to see if we could find uh, sediments from this uh, early Mars era. So after seven months of cruise, um, Spirit uh, reached Mars at seven kilometers per second. And the first thing you have to do if you want to, want to land on Mars is slow. So you can use the atmosphere. Unfortunately, the atmosphere is very thin. So the first part is like on the Earth. But then uh, the, the problem to land on the surface is that you have to really slow. If you were, if you were with the space shuttle, you will be at Mach 10, I think, when you reach the pressure which corresponds to the surface. So you need a hypersonic parachute, and that's not enough. What was used for the, the mass expression rover is a technique, technology which is derived from a car industry, automobile industry, airbags. So you slow, but not enough. So what is done here? You fill the airbags, and then you slow by retro rockets, you release, and you let go. So the gravity on the Mars is about one third of the gravity on the Earth. So the bouncing, when the first bounce went up to about 30 meters, it's quite impressive because this is really big. I've seen it in at NASA Ames. It's, it's, I don't know, you can see the size, but uh, each of these ball is about one meter. So it's a really big thing. So it is about 40 bounce and then stabilized. Of course, this is computer generated. the airbags were retracted, and in this kind of pyramid, all folded, you have the, the rover that I just showed you. This is really accelerated. In reality, this, all this is really slow. Everything about these robots, these uh, rovers, is really, really slow. So it was very carefully folded. The 
first thing you need is uh, solar panels to have power. And you also have here, you can see, a little mast that carried a thermal infrared spectrometer and, of course, a camera. And very quickly, we could see the landscape. And it was a little disappointing. Of course, the landing was a fabulous success. But what we found very quickly is that this surface is covered by uh, volcanic rocks. There's nothing about lake, sediments, nothing. This is basalt, basaltic rocks. Clearly, we are, we, the, the spacecraft landed on a kind of lava flow. It could be on the moon. It's just a volcanic rock. The volcanologists were happy, but only them. <laughs> so after that, uh, again, this is really accelerated. The rover can call descend from this uh, landing stage. Actually, it could take a picture, which is quite moving. Uh, if you were the, the guy who really worked on this, you can see Mars is a very dirty place. And then they went on. Um, to go on, the, this spacecraft, of course, you cannot remote control them uh, very easily because Mars is always quite far from the Earth. So uh, the round trip for a radio signal is about 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. So the time, if you see a rock, you say, go left, it's too late. So what, instead, there is a, in the computer, there you have a software, a kind of a intelligence, artificial intelligence software, which is uh, you, you give a waypoint to the, to, the, to the rover, and it decides its way. Uh, if it, it finds a rock, it goes around one way, another way. If it cannot do it, it stops and asks for instruction. It's very slow. Nevertheless, the first target was to do something that I will show you many times, is to find a crater that could have punched through the lava flow and maybe reach the layer where uh, they could have been um, uh, this remnant of this lake. And this is an example of a first crater which was nearby, um, impact craters named Bonneville. And you could see the bottom, but uh, what we could see clearly is that all this was still uh, made of basalt. It's just lava flow. On the other hand, far away here, you could see some hills which were named the Columbia Hills because it, this was uh, shortly after the disaster of Colombia in 2003, I think. And um, these hills were really far, too far to be reached by the, the, the rover in theory because the lifetime of the rover, they were designed to work for three months. But nevertheless, it was decided to go there, to go there and try to climb the hill. And what happened, if you look there, you can see that there is not much difference between the plane and the hill themselves. But when the, when the rover could climb on it right away, we could see that we le we, we, the, the rover um, left the lava flow, go on the hill, and the hill was much older. So the lava f it seems that the lava flow had flown around the hill and did not cover it. And once on the hill, it was discovered that it was a very ancient uh, place, but really uh, marked by not really liquid water in lakes, but more by hydrothermalism, volcanism, things like that. But you have lots of interesting things. For instance, very quickly, this rock we discovered, if you look at the shade here, it's named Pot of Gold. You can see that this rock has tentacles. It's very weird. And these are a concretion of, uh, of various minerals, and that this is all the signature of liquid water flowing underground, hydrological phenomenon. After that, Spirit climbed the hill, went around, went back, did a lot of things for many years. It was much more than three months. Let's talk about now the other. Uh, rover. This one is called Opportunity, went on the other side of the, p of the planet, and the location was chosen not because of the shape of the lake or something like that, the river, nothing like that. It was because a very weird mineral was detected there is hematite, it's uh, iron oxide. Iron um, oxide, which is usually on the Earth, is always formed when you have liquid water. And this hematite was only found in some location on Mars. So it was very intriguing, and uh, it was decided to send opportunity there to better understand what happened. So opportunity landed successfully. It was a big, uh, big, big success at JPL, big, big fiesta, to be honest. And then um, the first image was really intriguing. You can see it here. Uh, you can see that first the horizon is higher than expected, and second you can see this rock 
the outcrop of sedimentary rocks on the, on the, uh, very near the spacecraft. So it's very exciting for the first time to see sedimentary rocks. The reason why the horizon is higher is because the spacecraft actually landed in the little crater, and it was very fortunate because that's the, the crater had excaved these, uh, these, these uh, sedimentary rocks. And very quickly, of course, the, the rover was sent to investigate them. So this rover is not equipped with a lot of instrument, but five, kilo five kilograms of instrument. And you have a arm, which is the size of a human hand. And on this, you have various instruments. First, you have a rock abrasion tool, which is used to grind the, 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 the rocks and remo remove the altered minerals. And then it was possible to analyze the, the, the rocks with a microscope with the various spectrometer, alpha, proton, X. There is also a mass bower for those of you who are familiar with this kind of equipment. And what was discovered very quickly, was very exciting, is the fact that these rocks were actually very sulfate rich. And that was exciting because sulfate salts are usually evaporized. In other words, they form when you have a lake that uh, evaporates, and then you have what's left usually are sulfate. You have various kinds of sulfate, you have specialists in the room, jarosite, maybe some uh, gypsum. And it was also discovered that the hematite that had been discovered from, the, um, from space was in fact these little small uh, sphere, spheres that you can see here in false color in blue. And it, all this told, told the story about liquid water deposition in, in lakes. Um, it was also told the story about lots of wind erosion and dunes and re uh, mastering of all this, but it was very, very exciting. At the same time, remember, the mass expects... Uh, oops, sorry, I forgot uh, to, s to tell you something. I've been showing you a lot of uh, computer-generated images, so I want to warn you that uh, these, of course, are completely artificial. They can, you can show whatever you want, and especially for the kids, uh, the children in the room, I want to warn you, for instance, you can imagine what happened if the... Um, if the rock abrasion tool got stuck, I thought the, the, the computer specialist that made the image imagined that, but of course they're not physicists, so they got it wrong. <laughs> that doesn't, did not happen, of course. <laughs> While this uh, rover was making this exploration here, you can see a map at this red point on the left, Mars Express, the European spacecraft, was around Mars, mapping the mineral for the first time with a near-infrared imaging spectrometer, and that was very successful. And while um, the rover could find the sulfate in a little outcrop in a crater, Mars Express could find a huge area covered by sulfates that seem to have been uh, former lakes or something like that that formed in the past. We don't know exactly. More than that, Mars Express Omega was able to find big hills uh, mountains of uh, sulfate-rich sediments that will tell a story very intriguing about lakes forming, evaporating, forming again, and so on. And uh, this is an image from a combination of HRSC and Omega from Mars Express. So after that, the rover uh, left uh, its uh, initial nest and went to another place. And of course, the other place was to find a bigger crater to find, to go deeper in the time, deep, uh, to, to find it. So nearby, um, the first crater, which was around, it was Andurance Crater, 130 meter in diameter. And it was tempting to go there. By, by, and uh, the, the, it was okay because the rover proved to be very reliable and they were able to really uh, survive much more than the three months that were initially uh, uh, planned. The first crater was this crater, Endurance, and there again it was find this uh, very uh, impressive landscape. You have dunes at the bottom of the crater, and you can see some cliffs. And uh, analysis of these cliffs show that uh, they are all made of uh, sulfate rocks, hematites. It's a very consistent story. Lots of wind uh, reworking, gardening that uh, took place there. Once there, uh, nearby, the, the rover was able to discover the heat shield that had uh, been separated initially and that was not too far. Of course, the heat shield had no airbags. As you can see, it suffered from, uh, from the impact, but it was interesting to analyze it, for the, especially for the engineers. And then where to go? Well, it was decided to go to um, a crater, 
which was nine kilometers away. In theory, much too far to be reached by the rover, but the rover was so good, it was decided to go there anyway. And this crater was much bigger than Endurance, and it was very motivating to go there. Of course, to do nine kilometers with a rover, which was able to do 20 meters per day, people were worrying that it will be very slow. So it was decided to go very quick. And uh, in this uh, program that I told you about, that, is, that uh, control the, the, the driving of the rover, it was decided to, how to say that? This, com this computer is based, uh, among the parameters, you have a, a parameter which is called kind of cowardness. And it was decided to put this, uh, the coefficient, the cowardness coefficient to zero so that the, the rover will be extremely courageous and will, will go very quick, whatever happened. So it went very quick through the dunes and the, the sand, and of course, you know what happened. It got stuck in a, in a sand trap uh, the <coughs> in May 2005, if I remember well. And uh, you could see that it, it was very difficult. So everything was stopped. Every, everyone was very, very afraid because there was no one else to you know, dig with a shovel or whatever. So a lot of tests were performed uh, at GPL in May 2005. And uh, after maybe four weeks of trying uh, you know, uh, to do uh, ro rotate the wind th that direction, that direction, one like that, and so on, it was uh, discovered that the most efficient way was to put the wing like that and full speed back, and that worked. So finally, the the rover was able to get out of the sand and continue its journey. You can see here, Sol is a Martian day. Uh, in just um, a little more than uh, 100 day, half of the, the, the way had been done until you reach this pur purgatory is the dune that, that stuck the, the, the rover. And after that, you can see it went very slowly, very carefully, <laughs> to be sure. But finally, the Victoria crater Almost 800 meter in diameter was rich. <coughs> uh, in September 2006, and um, you can see this image is really nice because meanwhile a new orbiter has been launched by NASA, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which carried a very very uh, performant uh, camera, which was able to resolve the detail as small as 20 centimeters, and you can actually see the rover tracks and actual uh, rover on the surface uh, near this area. Sorry. So opportunity reached the edge of this uh, Victoria crater. You can see this uh, impressive landscape. This is actually a cliff. Uh, actually, to show the scale, the, the GPL guys made a, a little uh, mosaic like that. They put a an image of the rover, you can see this is really a cliff at the edge of the crater. So of course you don't want to go straight. You want to find a, a good way. They wanted to go down into the crater. So you, you have to find a good ramp down. Some tests had been done already for Endurance Crater in the past, and the rover showed that it could go down to a pretty steep slope with no problem. So it was very good. So after that, for, I don't know, maybe one year, <laughs> they went around the crater. I like to tell a joke that to look around for the best place to go down. And in the end, it was found that the best place was where they had been at the beginning. <laughs> it's not exactly true. They, they kind of knew that they, it would be a good thing to do. But. So they decided to go into the crater uh, here at Dug Bay. And again, uh, you have to remember all what is done with the rover is extremely slow. It took almost one year to do that. And then it took one year to go into the, ro the, the crater, explore it, and go back. So you can see the, the time. And finally, after exploration, again, sulfate rocks, hematite, a, a good story was put together with the, by the geologist. And finally, opportunity went out of the crater in August 2008. What's to do next? Well, to do, what's to do next is to go to a bigger crater. <laughs> a bigger crater with Endeavour. Um, very big thing, 25 kilometers across, with real big cliff on the side. And it was decided to go there. And it took two years to go to drive in a very boring landscape with uh, sand and some sulfate rocks. Uh, sometimes you see a meteorite that you can see here, very carefully um, driving. And after two years of driving, finally, uh, last August, the, this uh, Victoria was reached. You can see here, again, these uh, sulfate rocks and the rim of the crater. 
Very quickly, um, some interesting discovery we are done. You can see here, for the geologists who may be in the room, um, a vein of gypsum, uh, the signature of hydrological um, phenomenon, were observed uh, very quickly. And after that, for several weeks, uh, several months actually, the rover had to be put on a, on a slope to survive during the winter. I won't give you the detail with, with the solar panels. And you can see here at the bottom, the solar panels are covered with dust, so they're not very efficient anymore. Um, but uh, very recently, a few weeks ago, uh, the rover had started its mission again, and who knows what discovery. Uh, I encourage you to go on the website of JPL and see what will happen to opportunity. Meanwhile, Spirit uh, had the, the bad luck to also go into a, a, a trap of a, a sand trap and got stuck for good. They tried for um, several months to, uh, to put it uh, uh, out of the sand trap. You can see it was Operation Free Spirit, but that didn't work. Uh, Spirit didn't work. And finally, because the, the, it was not well oriented, uh, it actually died. The battery was not good. And uh, Spirit does not, you have no contact with Spirit anymore. Meanwhile, Mars Express, while still doing its operation into orbit, mapping. Uh, minerals, and even better than sulfate, the Mars Express uh, Omega Imaging Spectrum has discovered another mineral, which is clay. Clay is very common on the Earth, so you may say, so what? Well, clay is very common on the Earth because clay is the product of the alteration after thousands of years of basalt, volcanic rocks, with liquid water. So it was very uh, interesting to find clays uh, that we have the signature of uh, the interaction of liquid water with the surface uh, of Mars. And interestingly, clays were only found in very old location at the time, at least. So you can see here a very interesting area is the Mars Valley regions. In blue, this is not easy to understand, but in blue you have all the outcrop made of clay. You have various clays. If, you're, if you are a specialist in the room, I can give you details. But that really tell us a story different than the... Than the simple story of, of, of the sulfate. And in fact, along with uh, my French colleague on Mass Express, we could put together a story which will distinguish different era in the, in the history of Mars. You have uh, before 3.8 billion years ago, the era of clays, what we call Philosian, where probably maybe the Earth was a little, the Mars was a little Earth-like with a uh, river, uh, lots of alteration with water. Then another era, the era of sulfates, where you have a more acidic, uh, dry environment with uh, episodic lakes, with lots of evaporation, and then that's why we have evaporites, sulfates, gypsum, things like that. And after that, that means for most of the, of the lifetime of Mars, it was a kind of desert era. Nothing happened. In fact, I don't believe it's the desert era. I believe that it was the era of ice, because on Mars you have ice, lots of ice features, glacier stuff everywhere. And I will tell you a word about that, because that's a, another side of Mars which I think is very interesting. Of course, when you look at Mars like that, you don't see much. You, most of the surface of Mars is uh, covered by dust, because ice is not stable anywhere except in the polar regions. You can have frost for a few days, but that's it. Only ice in the polar regions. But buried below the surface of, of dust and sand, we know that there is lots of, of ice. To give you an example, you can, um, we see what, we, what is called rock glaciers in the tropics and in the mid-latitude of Mars in many, many uh, locations. That's another example of a rock glacier that flows from a small crater to another crater. And in fact, the ultimate proof that the subsurface of Mars is full of ice was done by uh, nuclear physics. The f the, the, an instrument was flown on a NASA spacecraft named Mars Odyssey. And this instrument ca uh, included a neutron spectrometer. So the physics is the following. Mars, like the Earth, like everyone, is, is, is uh, heated by uh, lots of gamma ray, cosmic ray, all the time, coming from space. On the Earth, they don't reach the surface because the atmosphere is too thick. But on Mars, it's not the case. They reach the surface, and then they dislodge neutrons from the core, from the nucleus of the atoms. These neutrons are ejected into space, and they can be measured by the spacecraft. So usually you can learn things on that. One thing you can learn in particular is the presence of water, because water 
uh, includes a lot of hydrogen, and if you remember the nuclear physics, for those of you, uh, hydrogen is a good, uh, because of its small mass, a good atom, a good nucleus to stop fast neutrons. That's why it's used in a nuclear plant. Anyway, when you have water ice, you have less neutrons that reach space, and with this principle, you can try to estimate how much water ice you have on the ground. It was expected to see a few percent, maybe 10 percent, ice filling the pores between the, the sand uh, or the rocks. And that's what not that was fine. What was fine is a huge amount. Uh, here in the, what is blue, this is a map of Mars, and what is blue here, so you can see between 55 and the pole, 55 degrees latitude on the pole in both hemisphere. You can see that the subsurface is actually like you can see on the right. You have a pure, almost pure ice layer uh, below a few centimeters of sand. This was only based on the neutron spectrometer observation. That was, you had to believe that. So uh, as a result, when this was discovered in 2001, 2002, it was decided at the time there were a selection of cheap mission toward Mars, it was decided to, s to launch a small spacecraft named Phoenix, which was launched in August 4, 2007. So Phoenix was targeted to go at this high latitude where it is expected that according to the neutron spectrometer that below a few uh, centimeter of dry sand, you will have pure ice. Uh, I cannot resist to show you again a movie of entry, descent, and landing because that's uh, something I work a lot on. <laughs> and, uh, and also because the system that was used for Phoenix was different than the airbags. They didn't use airbags this time. Though I went back to something that I think is really scary. <laughs> it's the traditional system which was used to land on the moon or for Viking rover. It's just uh, retro rockets and you control and you land. So you just release the heat shield, and then, so that's to, image, to show that there were an imaging uh, camera, and you just free fall for a few hundred meters, and then you, <laughs> you start the thrusters, and you have a computer with a radar that slow, stop, and land. It was very scary, but it worked. The previous system that was tried in 1999 didn't work, so that's why it was very scary. So of course there was a, a big suspense. What could be? the first view of this very enigmatic uh, polar uh, region. And in fact, it was not surprising. The first view of the Mars polar region was typically polar with the, <laughs> well, that's a joke from the Peter Smith, the PI, but the <laughs> it was actually really polar because you can see here, the, all these shapes on the surface is actually um, the signature of the presence of ice in the subsurface. I can show you an example from Antarctica. This is a rock glacier, so you have, a, a, again, dry a ground above ice, and you can see this polygonal structure, uh, the polygonal uh, geometry, which is characteristic of the presence of ice when you have permafrost. And this was observed in the location. And actually, very quickly, ice was discovered. You have, you see, uh, the, the solar panel, and you have a arm, robotic arm that carried a camera, and the camera quickly observed beneath um, the leg of the lander, and it was shown that ice had been exposed by landing thrusters, and the ice was exactly as expected, a few centimeters of dry sand and pure ice. So it was very surprising. We, don't, we don't, don't know for sure if this ice was actually pure, but this one here in this trench that was made by the, there is a shovel, a romantic shovel, uh, was really pure ice, 99% ice, very surprising. So where is this ice coming from, in glacier, in this location? Uh, there is some people, and it's still a very hot debate in uh, our, our uh, community. Is it because of the diffusion of water vapor in the subsurface, and that makes this, uh, do you have a physical process that enrich the ice, it's very complex. Maybe hydrothermalism, at least for the glacier was involved, or maybe uh, it was because in the past the climate was different, and you had atmospheric ice precipitation, snow, and uh, under a different climate. And has been, I have been working on proposing a lot on this last uh, apothesis, and uh, I won't show you the results, but we believe that really the climate was different and ice de was deposited in many locations on Mars because of the climate change, and the climate change because the orbit of Mars and the rotation axis of Mars varied in the past. On the Earth, the obliquity varied a little bit. The obliquity is the uh, angle of the axis of rotation on the plane of the orbit, so it's the inclination of the planet when it rotates. 
the, on Earth is stabilized, and the variation is only between plus or minus 1.3 degree, so it doesn't ma move much. Nevertheless, this little oscillation is enough to trigger uh, ice ages and the change that we know, uh, the geological change of the climate. On Mars, the variation is, is much higher, between zero and more than 60 degrees. So on this basis, we perform some uh, climate simulations. That's something I do a lot. I won't detail that. And we can demonstrate, that's just a, uh, an image, of course, but that w at high obliquity, the polar caps, which are currently at the pole, are not stable anymore, and they tend to form glacier in the mid-latitude and in the tropics. And when the obliquity goes back to what it is today, the ice doesn't go, doesn't go back directly to the pole. They actually tend to form a layer of ice, which actually um, Make Mar which will make Mars look like that uh, on the surface, covered by uh, water ice. And in fact, uh, this, uh, some of this ice probably sublimate when it becomes unstable, but some re probably remain buried below some sand, and that will explain what we observed with, uh, with the Mars Odyssey. So that's something we proposed and published, but uh, there is a debate uh, on that. It has been launched in November 26, 2011, very successful launch on, uh, 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 from, uh, Cape, from the Cape, and it's currently cruising, oops, sorry, it's currently cruising toward Mars, and it will reach uh, Mars uh, at the beginning of August this year, and I really encourage you to follow this story. And once again, I will show you how you will land on Mars with this thing, because this thing is so big, one, thousand kilogram to put on the surface that all the previous system could not work. So it was decided to use a new system. First, you can see some mass is, is, re is released just before entry to have an asymmetric uh, spacecraft so that you can pilot it during entry. Only the specialists will maybe understand this story, but because of this technology, you can have a very precise landing and you can estimate where you will land with an accuracy of about 20 kilometer instead of 100 kilometer in the past. The, sp the spacecraft actually fly through the atmosphere almost horizontally for a while, unlike what has been done before, again to ensure precision. And then some more mass. This seems small, okay, this is six times 25 kilograms of blood, which is just uh, is, uh, evacuated, and then you have a parachute. And then to land it, there is no uh, landing system uh, uh, ex exactly. What, what is done is, is the technology which is derived from what is used from helicopter. It's called the sky crane. And uh, the idea is that you put the rocket above the lander itself. You go slowly toward the surface, and you take advantage of the. Uh, oh, I don't know how to say that in English actually. The the wheel that will. Uh, amor Stop the impact. So you have a, you go slowly toward the surface with these rockets. And that's too, okay, there will be a fantastic imaging uh, camera going down. So it will be almost like a video. And then you have three cables that will be used to put very slowly the rover on the surface. I think it's very scary. This thing cost $2.5 billion. And I'm not sure it will work. I think it will. Because it, they have, it costs so much because uh, lots of attention have been put in the, in the testing of this. But it's very dangerous. Of course, you have a system to put this thing away. You don't want it to crash on the rover. And then this rover will uh, work on Mars. Before showing you more about I want to, I've not, I've not worked directly on this spacecraft, but I've I go to JPL in, in California, in Pasadena, near Los Angeles, quite often, and it, you can have access to the window where you can see these things work. And the development of this was absolutely impressive. It's absolutely big and very big. You can see the landing system above and uh, uh, some part of the rover below. Uh, this is in the white room, and this is really impressive. The heat shield is larger than the one used on Apollo. It's 4.5 meter uh, wide. It's really big. So this rover is really big, too. It's the size of a car, a small car in the US. In, in France, you can say the size of a car, but here, you have to be careful. The wheels are, are bigger than the car, actually, the wheel of a car. And you can see here, no solar panel. 
You can see here the, the thing at the, at the back of the rover is actually a small nuclear power plant. No, it's actually just a, you have heating and thermocouples to make energy, and all the energy will come the, from the plutonium there. You have lots of instruments on this spacecraft. One of it is this system. It's a laser. I don't know if you can see it well. It's actually shooting in the, in the infrared. I don't, I'm not sure we will see it on Mars. It's a, it's a laser that can shoot at rocks, vaporize the rock, and with a little spectrometer, you can estimate the composition of the rock. Um, this instrument is um, maybe more than half built in France and will be actually uh, controlled from Toulouse in France. You also have this really big arm. To tell you the size, the, the, the camera here where the laser is at 2.2 meters above the surface. And above on this arm, you also have lots of equipment, a little bit like on the small uh, Mars Expression Rover Spirit and Opportunity. You have a half a proton uh, spectrometer, you have a microscope, you have a grinder. And the goal this time is not only to look at the rock, but to actually make, take some sample and to put them inside the, the spacecraft where you have a lot of a small mic, uh, mini uh, laboratory. Um, if you want to know, you have one laboratory which is based on uh, X-ray uh, uh, spectroscopy. And the other one is uh, also uh, partly French. It's called SAM. It's the French part is made uh, one floor above where my office is. And is, uh, SAM includes, uh, for those who know, tunable diode laser, a mass spectrometer, and, um, and the gas chromatograph. And the gas chromatograph column, which are big, are made in France, provided by France. So it's collaboration between actually CNRS, CNES, and NASA. So you can see all the system, which is really complex, really expensive um, to, to analyze. And the goal here is to better understand what happened in the past, but also to detect maybe organic molecules that may have survived for billions of years and may tell us what happened four billion years ago. We don't know what we're, we're going to find. The rover uh, will go to a very specific place. It's been selected. Uh, a few months ago, it's called Gale Crater. It's near the equator, and it's, uh, you can see here this image. I think I have a better image there. It's, uh, you can see here the little circle in black here is the landing ellipse. That's where, the, uh, in theory, the, the rover will land. In blue, you have a, a path which is planned. And in the middle of this crater, which is about 150 kilometers wide, you have a big mountain, 5,000 meters uh, thick, which is completely sedimentary. So it will be very exciting to go on this mountain and look. You have some clays has been detected at the bottom, sulfate above that. So it, it is felt that, um, that this mountain can tell us the story about what happened in the past on, on this early Mars. Personally, I'm not so sure. I believe, I understand now that this, uh, I mean, my colleague geologists have shown that this crater is pretty recent. It's not very, very old. So I'm not sure that it will actually tell us what happened really a long time ago when clays were formed. But it will be absolutely fantastic to follow this story. What's next? Well, after, so that's a typical NASA chart. Um, after 2011, NASA will send an Arionomy orbiter named MAVEN Arionomy orbiter, which main goal is to understand what happened to the Martian atmosphere between early Mars, where you have a thick atmosphere, strong greenhouse effect, liquid water, and now the atmosphere escaped. Something happened to the atmosphere, and we don't know what. And the goal of this spacecraft is to understand how the atmosphere escaped from Mars, what happened in the interaction between the Martian atmosphere and the solar wind, the erosion by the solar wind, with the, the particles emitted by the sun, what happened to the atmosphere. And then after that, until recently, it was planned to have a, a joint project between NASA and ESA, it was called the John NASA ESA Mars Initiative, with uh, lots of projects. Uh, 2016, um, an orbiter designed to detect trace gases that could reveal the act activity in the subsurface, trace gases like methane or whatever, HCN if you want, something that could reveal maybe uh, uh, volcanic activity, hydrothermalic hydrothermal activity or maybe biological activity in the subsurface. There were also lots of instruments to do that. I was very, I'm very much involved in this project. It was also a, a demonstration lender from ESA. And then in 2018, it was planned to have a joint rover to, 
to do some astrobiology, try to understand better the possible biology that could uh, be on Mars, and also to prepare what is next, which will be the a time where sample return, where we could we'll send a spacecraft that could grab a, a sample and return it to, to the Earth. That was the plan until recently, but until recently, um, uh, recently, NASA decided that they could not do that. And after two years, uh, even more, of collaboration, working on that, they decided to stop the collaboration. And that was a big shock in Europe, I have to tell you. Um, uh, for us in Europe, it's a disaster. We are now trying to, teaming, to team with the Russian to save this project. Lots of millions and millions of euros have been put in that. Uh, the problem is that collaboration is extremely difficult. Uh, in the US, maybe people think that uh, this was too good for the Europeans, and actually in Europe, people think it was too good for the Americans. I believe really that this, the future of this kind of exploration has to be international, has to be um, with collaboration, for instance, between the US and Europe, or Russia, Russia and so on. Because it's the, the, the time of uh, when uh, the motivation was national prestige and competition, cold war stories, is, is gone. So, of course, this is really expensive. Science is not always enough, but exploration, the excitement, taxpayer excitement is, uh, is, in, is involved. And I think everyone, every taxpayer will be happy with international collaboration, and we gain a lot. So that didn't work this time. Uh, in fact, in Europe, this has been really bad, and I'm not sure people will be ready to go again soon. I think this will happen. So what I'm telling you here to Americans, I will tell the same story to Europeans. But now it's a real problem. So uh, what I understand that in a few days from now, the, uh, the NASA uh, scientists will gather and try to find something to do in 2018 instead of collaborating. It's too bad, I think. But uh, that's the way it is. OK. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois, for this uh, wonderful presentation and these uh, impressive uh, pictures. I am sure that there will be many, many uh, questions about what you presented. Thank you very much. Uh, the trench that you showed on Mars, it has uh, got an awful lot of unique features to it. It's quite deep, is it not? I don't know what the depth of it is, but you'd think that with the depth of that, there'd be also some sort of, are we getting some sort of probe into that trench to see what might be down there as far as life or any particular changes that might be appropriate? You're talking about the trench that were digged by the shovel and Phoenix? No, the, the trench on Mars, the very long trench, I don't know what they uh, particularly call that, but there's a, it looks like a, almost like a, like a Grand Canyon on Mars. Oh, right. That's, uh, this is huge. This is called uh, Valles Marineris, I think you're talking about. This is a kind of a, a graben, if you want. It's a, but it's a seven kilometer deep. It's very deep. But it's extremely wide. If you're in the middle of this trench, you don't see the, you, you, have, you, you feel, you think you are in the plane. So from space, it's really spectacular, but it's nothing like Grand Canyon. It's really big, and it's tectonic. It's, it, it comes from the time when the, a big volcanic uh, um, uh, bulge uh, was uh, formed nearby. It's a really big thing called named Tarsis. Lots of lava went out and some constraint, and the, the crust was, uh, was broken there. It's called the Graben. And it was, uh, then you have some uh, landslide, and it's a long story, lots of papers on that. And uh, it's not very old, but uh, it's, it's not from the time when we really had a lot of water, but it's from the time where the sulfate, it's full of sulfate deposits there. So it's a very interesting era, area, uh, but um, it's difficult to say that it's, uh, it's not really, uh, it's not really um, uh, sampling something deeper and older. It's actually the opposite. I don't know if that was your question. <laughs> what do you think are the, uh, the possibilities for geoengineering Mars so that it could be habitable, have an atmosphere and Okay, you're, 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 could live you're talking about, about a project that has been uh, popular in science fiction, but even in some scientific uh, papers, uh, which is called terraforming. The idea is to, to change the atmosphere of Mars so that first you can, uh, right now I told you the pressure is too low, so you need a spacesuit. 
So the first thing you could do is put a thicker atmosphere so you don't just need a good jacket and an oxygen mask and you can go around. And then ultimately we put some oxygen and you can breathe it and be happy. Um, there have been lots of papers in back 20 years ago and uh, at the time they were making sense. I believe personally that this will be almost impossible. And the reason is that all the discovery we have done in the past 10, 15 years show that the amount of what we call volatile, anything that could make an atmosphere, CO2, N2, whatever, is very, very limited on Mars. Uh, it will be very difficult to find, for instance, in the past, we used to think that there will be CO2 ice available in a, in a reservoir somewhere that we call sublime. You heat and sublime and put in the atmosphere and you have a thick atmosphere. There's no such thing, I, I believe. There might be some carbonate, in other words, CO2 transform into rocks, if you want, that you called uh, carefully uh, process to put back CO2 in the atmosphere, but I think it's really difficult. So compared to th this story, which was popular 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, I think now uh, you have to be pessimistic. I think it's almost impossible to put back a thick atmosphere, and that's the, the, that's the first thing you have to do to, to terraform Mars. So, uh, how many people have been working on this project? Would you say, what is the what is the 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 process of becoming a scientist who can work on this kind of project? It seems very sophisticated to me. The project on um, you mean all the project about Mars? That's right. Yeah. It's in specific, but when you work on it, it's you don't have this feeling because it's a. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you. And I call go on and go on. It's an entire word. And you have a few scientists <laughs> that has to figure out what is going on in this world. It's really a complex world. I told you, I just gave you a few examples, but honestly, there are lots and lots of complex processes in, on the, in the atmosphere, in the geology, in uh, the chemistry, whatever you want, is, is going on this planet. It's not like the Earth. It's a little like the Earth. And, um, so uh, it's not that specific. Now, the, you have, um, I could not tell you the number of people who work on uh, Martian exploration, from the engineers to the scientists. It's a community. We know many of, uh, we know each other, but I don't know, it's a few hundred people all together. And uh, of course, working on the spacecraft and the development and so on is even much more because you have all these engineers in the industry, in the space agencies, the scientists, it's a lot of people. And you actually, you can estimate that from the cost of the mission and divide by the salaries and you have the, <laughs> because it's not the, it's, it's not the, the aluminum which is expensive, it's the, it's the brain. So it's a lot of people. Hi, could you explain to non-scientists why is it that if uh, Mars is so cold that if you don't have a space suit, your blood would boil? So I understood only the first part. So why Mars is so cold and? And because it's so, so you said that if you if you don't go out with a big jacket, your blood will boil. Okay. But so it's so cold, so why would that be? I know it's about the pressure, but I'm a non-scientist, okay. so I was wondering if you could explain it. So the reason why Mars is so cold, on average, is because it's far from the from the sun. It's 50% uh, further from the sun than the Earth. So it receives about half of the solar energy than the Earth receives. That's on average. On every day. Uh, if you go there, as I told you, during the day it's pretty warm, but the, the, on, during the night it's really cold. On average, it's minus 50, minus 70. Now, the problem with the pressure is that you have a thin atmosphere. The pressure is very low. And as you know, the boiling point of water is uh, controlled by pressure. For instance, if you use a pressure cooker, you can have a, the boiling point will be, uh, will be uh, at a uh, warmer uh, temperature instead of 100 degrees Celsius. I don't know how, it, how much is it in Fahrenheit. Maybe you can help me. Um, it's 120, and you can cook your uh, vegetables quick, more quickly. If you go in the mountains, it will take more time to cook your uh, pasta because the pressure is lower. So you, the, the water will boil at 80 degrees instead of 100 degrees Celsius. The problem is that the pressure there is so low that the pressure, the boiling point, is at uh, maybe uh, 5 degrees Celsius. That means that if you go there with your s blood, which has to be at 37 degrees Celsius, which is around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, your, 
you will boil. And uh, that's a problem, it's almost true. In reality, the problem is really complex because uh, it takes a while to boil and actually I'm, I'm not sure it boils, but something bad will happen. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Julie can comment on that. I don't know if you ever try to go in. in uh, it, it does, it's not as simple. There are bad movies uh, that shows you explosion of people. It's not that true, but something bad happens. So you need a space suit to, to work on Mars and that's, that's too bad. Before I came today, I heard that Ray Bradbury had died. And I seem to remember he wrote something called The Martian Chronicles, and it was a, an extremely popular television program or, or film several year, many years ago. And I wonder if someone like Bradbury did more than any other living writer to make exploration of Mars popular and interesting for the general public. Well, The Martian Chronicles are great, but they are tales uh, that tells you a story about humankind and things like that. I like them, I like science fiction, but the goal here was to tell you true story, the real planet Mars, which I think is exciting. It's the, what's going on on the planet, the geophysics, the atmosphere, and the exploration, the robots, I think it's really exciting. I, have, I, will, I could go on and go on with really lots of good stories about the robots and what's going on in the storms and the frost and uh, lots of interesting things going on. And I think this real Mars is worth uh, uh, telling, uh, uh, it's worth explaining. What, what is the uh, single most uh, important piece of information that we can derive from Mars exploration and how will we benefit from this here on Earth? The reason why we go to Mars are well, I don't have to tell you about space exploration or whatever, but the reason why we study Mars, uh, you have several reasons. First is because Mars is very Earth-like. And um, when we study other planets, and especially Mars, we learn a lot about our own planet, geology, climatology, things like that. Just like in biology, you study uh, um, apes, uh, chimpanzees, to better understand the, the, the you know, medical problems. So by doing that, you, you learn a lot, because only studying the Earth is, is difficult to understand how a planet works. So, so we study other planets, and Mars is really like the Earth, much more like the Earth than all the other planets in the solar system. The second reason, and that's the big finding of space exploration, is this idea that Mars was like the Earth four billion years ago, when life emerged on the Earth. You also had lots of liquid water and lakes on Mars, so that life may have started there. And uh, it's, it, it's, it may sound a little uh, science fiction and whatever, but the exp exp trying to figure out if life started there is very interesting. And more than that, now on the Earth, there is almost no more rocks that are older than three billion years. Very little um, in some location in Greenland, South Africa, Australia. It's very difficult to find them. We have almost no information about what happened on the Earth before uh, three billion years ago, or even 2.5 billion years ago. Mars is, is, is a book that can tell us what may have happened in the solar system and on a planet like the Earth at the time. So that's very interesting for that too. So it's not only life, but not finding life or finding pre-life chemical processes is also interesting. And I have to say, com in compared to other area in the solar system, uh, Mars is a little special because it's easier to go there. It's easier for spacecraft, it's cheaper, we have lots of interesting places in the solar system that I personally love, but it's very difficult to go there. Mars is easier, even though you can have problems. Um, it's cheaper, and it will also be true for, uh, for astronauts. So the, a part of the motivation for space agencies to s better understand Mars is with the back in the mind that maybe in the future we will be able to send astronauts there with the support of taxpayers. Uh, that will be happy to give a few dollars and euros to, um, to uh, share the excitement and, um, and feel that there is humankind as a destiny of exploration and whatever. So, um, so that these are the reasons we explore Mars. And I think, again, the, the main finding is this fact that Mars, early Mars, was most like the Earth. So I'm glad you brought up the question of life on Mars, because if it did exist at one time. It sounds like the most likely place you'll find it, if it still has uh, persisted, is in that subsurface 
layer where you have ice. So the question is whether the current probe that will be landing in August or any of the future probes have experiments aboard that would uh, answer to a fairly uh, high degree of certainty whether there is, in fact, life still existent in, uh, on Mars? That's a very good question. It is true that if you imagine that some life emerged, like on the Earth, 4 billion years ago, 3.5 billion years ago, the place where you could have a niche and you, have, you could have life uh, in the subsurface will be in aquifers, where you could have liquid aquifer that could, could be kept warm by the geothermal heat deep in the crust. R so far, we have developed design radar to try to detect this, but uh, that has been unsuccessful. We have also some speculation that near the surface or in some location, because of salts that can make brines that can be liquid, there may be liquid water in some area uh, with lots of salts and so on. So um, it is true that uh, the idea that there could be some life in the subsurface or using taking advantage of brines that can be uh, liquid at very cold temperature is in the air. But the problem is that, for instance, if you want to, to explore a subsurface aquifer, you have to drill, drill very deep, quite deep, uh, maybe a few hundred, well, maybe a few thousands of meters. And right now, people are convinced that you cannot do that uh, just with robots. It's too difficult. Uh, all the experience we have of drilling on the Earth tells us that you need humans. So maybe uh, a good motivation to send humans there will be uh, to do this kind of, uh, of scientific uh, exploration, drilling. I think it's very difficult with robots. I think we have time just for one more question, and then, uh, of course, you will be able to ask other questions during the uh, wine and cheese reception. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Regarding, uh, regarding life on Mars, um, are there orbital uh, satellites on Mars that are detecting methane blooms that are seasonal, that are suggestive of possible life uh, activity on Mars? I've been working a lot, a lot on that, too. So that's a story I didn't tell you. <laughs> it's the, idea, the fact that uh, some time ago, a few scientists, several scientists, have dis detected the presence of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. And methane should not be there because it's not stable. So you need a source of methane. And on the Earth, the source of methane is biology. So it was very exciting, and lots of people concluded that some bugs <laughs> are making some uh, bacteria, maybe are making methane, although you can also make methane that other mechanism. But this is controversial. Uh, most of the measurements are very difficult to confirm. The most convincing one was actually made by a, a gentleman named Mac Muma, who works very not far from here at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, they have done a very interesting, very careful uh, detection of methane using big telescope from the Earth with very high resolution spectrometer along with a, a guy named Geronimo Villanueva. Uh, and they have almost demonstrated they have measured methane. But what was really surprising, that not only they measure methane, but they measure variation of methane. That was surprising because methane should not be varying, should be well mixed everywhere on the planet. And the fact that you have variations means that you have a very really big source and a big thing, something that destroys methane very quickly. And we don't understand what, what this is. So as for me, for instance, I wrote a paper in a journal named Nature where I'd say that you cannot explain what the, these observations with known physics and chemistry. That's the title of the paper. It was published, lucky me. It's impossible to explain methane on Mars, varying methane on Mars, with known physics and chemistry. And there is a real problem. And now um, it's controversial. And now the problem is that Mike Muma and Jeronio Villeneuve claim that they cannot detect methane anymore. They f sh f detect methane in 2003 and 2005 and say there's no more methane. So it will be very difficult to prove that they were methane or not at the time, to confirm it. The good news is that Mars Science Laboratory, the big rover, is carrying a small instrument named a tunable uh, laser uh, spectrometer and uh, uh, diode. And this will be able to detect methane with an exquisite sensitivity. And we will see what it discovers. So the answer to this story, very exciting story, because it is true that if there is methane varying, as observed by Mike Muma and the colleagues from uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, 
it's almost demonstrating that something incredible, like life on Mars, is active right now. If there is no more methane, or methane is not varying, and that will be confirmed or not by Mars Science Laboratory, then we will, we, we will dismiss or not this hypothesis. And uh, so the answer will be in a few weeks from now. I have a two-part question. Number one, uh, given economic and political constraints around the world, what do you think a realistic time frame would be for putting uh, human beings and astronauts on Mars? And number two, there are four billionaires right now working on a project to mine uh, the asteroid belt for water. Uh, what do you think about that? And what do you think that will do to impact the possibility of mining slash drilling into the aquifers, into possible aquifers on Mars? Well, the first question is uh, when it will be possible to send human ads. It's a very, my feeling, I've been working, I've been in committees and various things. I'm not an astronaut, but uh, is that it will be very expensive and thus difficult. N right now, there is a new idea coming from Barack Obama, actually, and uh, the, 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 whatever, the, the various committees that uh, worked initially in the, during the, at the beginning of its, uh, of its uh, mandate. It's the idea that maybe what we could do first is to send astronaut not on Mars but around Mars and that's much easier because landing on Mars and leaving Mars is quite difficult right now. You have lots of problems. Maybe the thing that could be done in our lifetime, <laughs> not that far away, would be to send human around Mars in orbit. You may say, what, what, what the heck, why, why, why should we do that? Actually most of my colleagues believe it's not a good idea and uh, we should go on the surface and do the good science. I think it's so complex that I'm kind of interested in this other idea, and I can tell you I'm not a typical scientist from that way. I think it's a good idea because among the things that you can do, first you can, it's interesting to go there, it's quite a challenge, and a, I think it's a quite an adventure. But then, the thing that is really different when you are around in orbit around Mars is that you can put uh, very so sophisticated uh, uh, robots, for instance, and the good thing with the human exploration is that you have much more modern than robotic exploration. So you have really good robots. You can put them on the surface and do direct remote control. You can imagine a kind of avatar on the surface of Mars without going there. And uh, that may be an interesting step, I think. But there is a debate. Again, many of my colleagues believe that we should advocate a full mission to Mars, landing, the big adventure, and so on. But I believe it will be very difficult. I do believe that the first thing, you, before going to Mars, you have to go back to the moon. And once I say that, I think 20 years, 30 years are gone right away. It's really, really uh, long to develop all that. And uh, so we'll see what happens. No, for the private industry, uh, why not? But it's really expensive. It's not the same. You know, private industry is only just starting to put things in orbit around the Earth. And going to Mars and landing on Mars is uh, billions and billions of, uh, of dollars <laughs> and euros. Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you.